You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom, chaverim shalanu. Toda sheitztaraftem elenu batochnit pinim mehanviim. Shalom, friends. Thank you for joining us on the program, uh, Pearl. What's the name of the program? Crap. <laughs> we'll start over. Okay, hold on. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Wait, what's the name of the program? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Torah Pearl. Sorry. <laughs> no, Prophet Pearls. <laughs> no, because I'm reading the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it says, <laughs> but yeah, okay. We're keeping this for the show. <laughs> no, no, no. Are you kidding no. me? <laughs> God. No, we give you right, a chance to start over. Up the <laughs> 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 okay. <opening> us. <laughs> Shalom, our friends. Thank you for joining us in the program. Prophet Burles and Keith. What does Chavirim mean? Can you explain to the people? All right, let's, get, let's just start. <laughs> It's my first time starting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, boy. No, mm. let's do it. Jeremiah. All right. Here we go. Yeah. We're at, uh, we're in Jeremiah. Yeah. And, Je- um, yeah, so this is, this is the, you know, this is the um, 15th episode. It's Jeremiah 46, 13 to 28, and it corresponds to the Torah portion of Bo, uh, Exodus mm-hmm. 10, 1 through 13, 16, and this is a section about the plagues. And the reason this is chosen, presumably, is because it's about how Egypt is going to suffer a, another smiting, another plague, but this time at the hand of the Babylonians. You know, I was, I was, I was looking again at, yeah. back to the original Torah pearls. You know, it was really something when we went through that. Um, for those that don't know, we went through that from I think it was in 2000. I, I, Nehemiah, give me the year 2012. Um, um, well, no, we started in 2011. We finished in 2012. We finished in 2012. No, wait a minute, that's not, is that even right? I'm yeah. Not sure. no, but yeah, that's well, right. That's right. That's right. Whenever it was that yeah, we did that, 11, um, what was what was really powerful about it is we were looking at a fresh look at the um, Torah portions, and mm-hmm. and I think when I it, for those that don't know, the Torah portions are um, paralleling here with the prophet portions are paralleling with the Torah portions. If you haven't listened to that, you can listen to the original Torah pearls program on NachemiasWall dot com, BFAInternational dot com. Both of uh, those sites have. Um, access to the entire year of those Torah portions. And what's nice about that is you can listen to those every year. Um, and of course, now Prophet Pros, we're 15 in. Hopefully, we'll get to 52 or 54, and, and they'll also be made available so that you can listen year after year. But what was re- refreshing to me was to um, look at this parallel passage as it pertains to what's happening with Egypt. And I have to just tell you, honestly, this is going to, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how to say this. I, I felt bad when I was, I, I was like looking at, at Exodus uh, chapter 10 and 11 and 12 and, and I believe it's up to 13. And then I go here and, and I'm looking in Jeremiah and I mean, Egypt boy, I mean, it, being used by the, the hand of God to, to, to do what Egypt did. I mean, boy, oh boy, you talk about stuff coming upon them. <laughs> I just, I was reading that from back then and then reading this. And then of course, last week's uh, portion that we did in the prophet pearls, also speaking about uh, Egypt. I mean, it, and we see it over and over and again in scripture. And of course we could probably go to the computer and how many times we see Egypt being spoken about in, in its future. Um, but it really is, it really is a, 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 a central place uh, certainly as it pertains to the land of Israel, speaking about every time we talk about it, who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Well, it's not just that simple. Everything else that happened with Egypt mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, it just goes yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper each time. Yeah, you know, I, last year I was a, a, a English teacher in a Chinese high school. And one of the things I taught my students, you know, I, ha- I had to like crystallize the message down to something really simple. And um, one of the things I told them is my ancestors, the Yotairan, the Jews, they were uh, slaves in Egypt. They were slaves that were liberated from Egypt by Yehovah, by Yehovah, mm-hmm. and brought out into the desert where he revealed himself to them and spoke to them. And, and, and that was, you know, one, the key part of the story that they all understood. Um, yes, your ancestors were slaves in Egypt. Like, we got this. <laughs> yeah, we got that yeah. part. Yeah. But, but it really but it's, that, so, it's, it's something that I think in the Western world we take for granted. Um, exactly, because it's just so known and so obvious. This was the first time they had ever heard it, and so it was a it was mm-hmm. a message I had to like drive home, you know. 
Well, here's the other thing about it as we get into this is when you speak of Egypt again, the picture mm-hmm. can be, yeah, we, you know, the movie The Ten Commandments for the Westerners. You know, The Ten Commandments, yep, they were there. They did, you know, they dealt with some bricks and, and this, that, and the other, but they were brought out with a strong hand and the, the story, in, you know, starts there. But there was so much more, such, such a level of depth of what took place in the land of Egypt yeah. and then again throughout history as we, as we find. So it is pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh, well, here we know, go. And, and then there's this phrase like, "Why did Israel need to go down to Egypt for 400 years?" And it says in Deuteronomy 4:20, for example, it appears three times in Tanakh. Um, it says, "And you, Yehovah, took and He brought you out mikul habarzel mimitzrayim from the mm-hmm. iron furnace from Egypt." And, and the image there, actually, mm-hmm. the more correct term probably is a crucible, which is like mm-hmm. this little furnace where you melt the, or little device where you melt the, the. Um, you know, really high temperatures, the um, the iron, and then you can make it into whatever you want it to be. And it says, to be for him a nation and an inheritance as this day. So that was the crucible in which Israel was formed. They they went in as a as a band of, of shepherds, and they came out as a nation. Mm-hmm. And that also appears you know, in, in Jeremiah 11.4 and 1 Kings 8.51. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something, when, I'm, when you're reading this, uh, you know, as we're starting in uh, 46, I believe it's 13. By the way, I have mm-hmm. to say um, thank you to our... our Prophet Pro Partners, um, it's not often that we get to say um, the last name, but we have to say the last name here because it's the family of some friends that we met some years ago. And I mean, we were out on the road. I can't remember when it was. Again, I get really bad. I'm really bad with dates. I think it was 2010 or something like that. We were in some uh, place in Colorado, Johnstown or Johnson Town, or <laughs> I think it was my town. And we met these guys that, that were twins. And these twins, we took a picture way back then. Uh, it's the Mendez brothers, actually. I think it was and, Greeley, uh, Colorado, actually, but yeah. Was it, was it in Greeley? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the first time when we met them, um, when we met them the first time, they actually came all the way to Johnstown to meet us. And and then we met them in Greeley when, on this last time when we were there for um, for the tour that we did just this last year. But let me just say this. What I, what I, what was interesting about them is it, it's, it's so cool when you meet a family or you meet someone from some years ago. And then, you know, here it is all these years later, which would have been 2014. Um, they showed up for an event that we did in Colorado and Greeley with our friends, uh, Sven and Tina, who, who who really put the whole thing together. And uh, they were there. And so they, they um, the Mendez family actually um, chose this section. And I'm going to ask them to actually write something we'll put in our comments. Again, everyone that's listening, hopefully they'll use the comment section at NehemiahsWall.com, BFAInternational.com. And either way, wherever you, you post, post on the other one also because there's a, just a mixture of people. So I want to say thank you to them for being our Profit Pro uh, partners. Uh, they're the twins. We're the twins. And uh, they still look alike, and we don't look alike at all. So I'm not sure what You're beginning about. to look more like me, especially your hair. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, so so here's one thing I wanted to bring up in 46-13. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it says, and this is the message which Jehovah spoke unto Jeremiah the prophet about the coming of Nebuchadnezzar. And again, it's that spelling, Nehemiah, uh, where there's the resh instead of the uh, the Dalit. We talked about it last week. Nebuchadnezzar, um, not Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, but King of Babylon. And you know, when, so when I read this, so we're in our society now where I could, like, for example, I'm a day ahead of you, okay? So I get on an airplane, I come over here, and I call you up and I say, you know, uh, I, I've heard from the Lord. Um, the moon will not show up in the east, and, yeah. and you're, you know, and because I'm over here and you don't know I'm over here, oh. and sure enough, the next day it doesn't show up. Well, here's what's so cool. So, so Jeremiah didn't get on an airplane and go and find out, now, what's the situation with Nebuchadnezzar? Now, is he going to be coming or not coming or, you know, <laughs> there's no tracking there's him no, by GPS. <laughs> yeah, I'm not tracking him by GPS, no international travel. So he hears from the one who, I mean, so Jeremiah is placed here in Israel. He hears from the creator of the universe, this is what's going to happen, and then he declares it. No sleight of hand, no smoke and mirrors, no, I've got people that's spying and telling, no, I, I just, you know, I mean, it's it's an obvious thing, but he really has to hear from, from him. It's, there's no technology that would allow him or no uh, internal communications, you know, where he can, you know, text real quick and quickly, what, what's, what's the situation? I don't know. That... <laughs> It, it's, it seems like something that we could take for granted, but it really is hearing from, from the one who knows all. And that's exactly what happens. He receives this message from Yehovah, spoken to the prophet Jeremiah about what's going to happen, and very specifically with, by name, the king of Babylon to come and smite the land of yeah, Egypt. Yeah, and, and um, you know, so, so you, you have the word smite there? Is that what you have? Yep. In, in, what mm-hmm. translation is yep. that? That's the NASB. Okay. And, and I like that word. So in the JPS, it has to attack the land of Egypt. And, and what's really significant more so is the word in Hebrew, which is lahakot. 
mm-hmm. at Eretz Mitzrayim, which is, you could say, to smite, to hit, the hakot at Eretz Mitzrayim. And the reason that's important, uh, at least for tying in with the, with, um, with the story in Bo in, in the in, you know, Exodus, is, um, is that you know, we have that same verb used, that same word used to describe the plagues of Egypt. And we mm-hmm. call them, even today, to this very day, we call them, you know, the, the ten makot, the plagues. Mm-hmm. And um, so so the point is that there's there's a, a word connection there between mm-hmm. the, um, you know, the, the plagues of Egypt and the smiting of Babylon. It's the same word in Hebrew. The word that you have is smite, and the JPS has as attack, and the King James has as smite as well. So that's the mm-hmm. word that, that means plague, to hit with a plague. And that you appears know, it's interesting. in Exodus. I was... I was yeah. going to ask you, uh, Nehemiah. I don't know if you uh, have you picked the word of the week. I'm on. I'm always asking no, that early I haven't. in the process. Could you pick? I mean, could it be this one? I mean, is this something that you'd feel comfortable with, or would you would you prefer to? Yeah, would you prefer I want to, to look save at something mine else? for the end because honestly, okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay, no, those then are you some have really hot one. verses there. I don't have one. Okay. But, like, I could choose any word in verses 27 to 28 and be really happy. <laughs> okay. Well, let's do that. We're okay. going to wait. We're going to wait for that. Hey, but what, what, what was interesting uh, about that, you, you brought that up about uh, Le Hakot. Yeah. So when you, when, you, when you look at the word and you're, you're trying to find out, okay, where that word is used, and it's, it's so – I don't know how to put this. I, I'm, still, I'm still amazed at the, um, the way the language – uh, you know, is used the, the way the Hebrew language is used because again, you can hear that word lehakot, and immediately in your mind, you, when you hear that word, because you've heard Bo read how many times, how many, how often, and and, and and hearing this most amazing event that took place, uh, to know that there's a connection between the words, and again. For those of us who who are English uh, speakers who are reading the Bible year after year after year in English, it, it's not something that's always obvious. It's not something that jumps off the page. Depending on what translation you're reading, you wouldn't make that connection. And so, again, I guess this is the advantage of being able to to read it in the language in which it was written. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I want to bring mm-hmm. up something a little controversial about mm-hmm. this passage. Can we? Can we? Do, or do you just want to want to jump into it and then the controversy? Yeah, let's will get come, right into it. Yeah, yeah the, the controversy get, get... will naturally come up. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So 46.14, declare in Egypt and proclaim in Migdal. Proclaim also in Memphis and Tophanes. Say, take your stand and get yourself ready for the sword has devoured those around you. I want to just read one more verse here. For 15, why have you, your mighty ones, become prostrate is what it says here. They do not stand because Yehovah has thrust them down. And, and I'm, so I'm, I'm reading this again. And, and, it, and, it's, and again, the, the thing that we have to remember is he's not speaking here of Israel. He's speaking here of Egypt. And again, we're mm-hmm. looking at Egypt at you know at this particular time and yeah. before, where Egypt could be seen as strong and a mighty nation. I was, um, I was, and I know people can really get into this right now. Um, you see different nations, even in our time, Nehemiah, where you'll see a nation that will be that will look like it can never ever have a change, and then see a change come just drastically. I'm looking at Russia right now, and it happens to be December that we're we're actually um, recording this uh, in 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 mid December, and in the last week in Russia. Uh, if you'd have gone 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, and said the word Russia, you would have seen this, you know, mighty, amazing, you know, yeah. strong-armed uh, <clears throat> nation that's had so many radical changes over these last uh, couple decades. And now, in the last week, with what ha- what's happened with the ruble, you, you know, it's like whoa, 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 what's you know, what's going on here? And, and again, it's an example in modern times where we can actually see change. How far it will go, we don't know, but definitely it's a teetering situation, and that's what. Wait, this is your does. chance, Johnson. You can make a prophecy. No, I'm not. And if make it's a wrong, prophecy. you can say, "Well, they repented," and if it's right, you can say, <laughs> "I speak the word of the Lord." You can speak about how uh, you know Russia will be crushed with the iron rod. You know, come on, give give me some prophecy here. No, no, no. I'm not going to play around. I'm not a no, prophet. Okay. I'm the son of a prophet. And you know, it's really but interesting. I, I'll, I'll I hear especially news. certain types of Christian <laughs> sayings. Oh, I received a word from the Lord. And, and that's a really serious statement. I don't know if they realize that. So to receive a word from God, that's a, that, that means, you know, Jeremiah talks about this. And, and, you know, that that means you were standing in the throne room and you heard God speaking to the angels. And, and the word, you know, and I noticed in verse 13, I know we, we're past that, but you, you translated your verse 13. Um, mm-hmm. You know that he received. What was it that he received there? According to uh, this is the message. The message, right? Oh, right. So in Hebrew, it's davar. It's the davar that uh, Yehovah spoke to Jeremiah the prophet, and davar is word. You know, and we talked about how there's the three sections. There's the Torah, the word, and the and the wisdom. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, this is prophet word means prophecy in this context. You got to be really careful about saying, I received a word from the Lord. Mm-hmm. That means Jehovah spoke directly to you and you, or, or you heard mm-hmm. him speaking to the angels. You heard his mm-hmm. voice. Be careful about that. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So he, but again, speaking here about what, what's going to happen in Egypt and looking at present time. And again, mm-hmm. it, it's not just, it's not just Russia. There's a whole bunch of things that are going can, on around the world. Can I, can I make a present. confession here about this whole, mm-hmm. this entire passage up until the two verses that I'm going to, you know, hopefully <laughs> get a chance to talk about, which is really the last two verses. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't, how do I say this, you know, without being disrespectful to the word of Jehovah? Cause every word is mm-hmm. precious. Every letter, every jot and tittle is, is, is holy. But at the same time, I'm hearing this. And part of me is kind of like, I, I really don't care. Does, is that a horrible thing to admit? Do we have to edit this out? <laughs> Folks, no, uh, Nehemiah has just made a uh, confession, so he's going to be quiet the entire Wait, time no, until the it, last verse. Can I tell you what I and mean I'm by take that? This, no, Wait, can I tell you what I mean? So this is prophesying <laughs> the destruction of Egypt, and I'm hearing this, yeah. and I'm thinking, like, Egypt being destroyed and going into exile and being brought from exile. I, I, I'm not Egyptian. Like, what, what, what is this? You know, what, this, this has nothing to do with me. This, you know, there's so many prophecies. Most of the prophecies are to Israel, but here we have this prophecy to Egypt, and it's like, um, okay, when do we get to the Israel stuff? I, I just, you know, and, and, it, and it actually gives me some empathy for, you know, I've encountered Christians. Um, and this is really controversial, but it's true. I've encountered Christians who I'll be speaking to about, you know, the ingathering of the exiles and the rebuilding of Israel, and they'll be like, well, where's Jesus in that? We just don't even want to hear this. This has got nothing to do with us. Because you know, they, mm. you know, they're, they're literally yawning and bored. They can pretend they're interested, but they're not. Mm-hmm. But, but I think this is really important con- con- context to get. So I'm going to jump to Jeremiah chapter one verse five. It says, "Before I created you in the womb, I selected you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet concerning the nations." And in Hebrew, it says, "To the nations." So Jeremiah mm-hmm. was kind of an unusual prophet. He actually spoke to the nations. Um, mm-hmm. Not just, and, and maybe the other prophets did too, but Jeremiah, I think even more than the other prophets, was speaking to the Gentiles. Um, mm-hmm. v- chapter 1, verse 10, see, I appoint you this day over nations and kingdoms to uproot and pull down, destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And, you know, in Hebrew, the word there is ha-goyim, al ha-goyim, over the nations, over the what we could call today in, you know, in, in English terms, Gentiles. Um, so we have this, this, this theme that Jeremiah is, you know, a prophet for the nations. And we read here about... You know, and it's interesting, read, read the prophecy, and we don't have time to do it, but read the prophecy of of, of, of Egypt and the other nations and, and some of the other prophets, and it sounds to me like he's speaking to Israel saying, hey, you guys want to hear what's going to happen to, to Egypt? It's really bad. Um, aren't you glad you, you know, worship Jehovah? Whereas Jeremiah speaking, I, I hear him, you know, I hear this in like, it sounds like he's speaking to the nations, really does, and not, not to Israel. Um, and there's a really interesting thing, and we probably don't have time to go into it, but um, there's a whole bunch of other verses. But one of the verses talks about one of the most important verses in the Bible. It speaks about how, you know, they, mm-hmm. they, he gathered in these, um, you know, he was speaking his message to these ambassadors that would then be sent out throughout the mm-hmm. entire world. Um, and these were, you know, just like, you know, today we have ambassadors in, you know, in, in you know, Washington, D.C. And if you mm-hmm. wanted to communicate a message before the Internet uh, in the old days, one of the ways to do it was you would you'd call in all the ambassadors and tell them, hey, guys, this is what's going to happen. Um mm-hmm. And, and that's what Jeremiah does. He, he, you know, cause think about it. So he's sending this message to the nations. Like, did Jeremiah actually go to Egypt? Probably not. Uh, well, he did at the end of his life, but at this stage in his life, he hasn't gone to Egypt, but he's spoken to the Egyptian ambassador and he's spoken to the other ambassadors and told them, this is the word of Jehovah that came to me concerning Egypt. You need to pay attention to this. You know, I, it's, it's interesting when you say, when you say uh, you read that and you say he doesn't. You know, you're like, well, I'm not uh, Egypt. I, the yeah. actually the thing that really does excite me um, is that is this is this what I call us is international um, uh, call this international um, hand this hand that, that uh, our father has over the, over everything. So when I read this yeah, and I'm hearing I th- that, yeah. the most the most important thing I, I think is in 13 when it says this is this is the word this is the devour that he spoke yeah. and so he's hearing hearing this so this is coming from the mouth of God immediately whatever it is and I mean I'm just you know I mean uh, you got to let me be the the, right. the 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 pastor for a second it's like whatever it is that's coming from him is somehow interconnected with everything and so like yeah. I'm looking at this and I'm like whoa <laughs> he's talking right. now to this <clears throat> nation right. and again what what caught me in the very beginning was I went back and read Exodus 10 11 you know looking through those passages again and again we we did this we did this uh we did this um uh, original uh torah pearls years ago and 
and yet it's like it, it's like it just jumps it, it, it's like it just comes right and like grabs me and it thinks wow this is this is this land that he's speaking about in other words it's not just a pass through there's something about it that's uh, even as we talked about reciprocal justice and right. what happens later and how it's all connected i mean i just wow <laughs> yeah well, just, you know, yeah sorry go ahead so go ahead. So, ahead. so one of the things that strikes me about you know like i have this guilt <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you that i don't care about this and I'm, it's not that i don't <laughs> care but it's it's literally boring to me i'm reading about you know um, you know, Nof and Tachpanches and, and Migdol and all these places in Egypt. But, uh, you know, I'm like, you know, <laughs> let's get to the Israel part already. And part of me feels really bad about that, feels guilty. And, and I'm reminded of this of this legend that the rabbis tell, which, you know, it's, it's not a historical event, but it, but it makes a really good point, which I think is profound. And, and it's the story about when the when the Israelites saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore, they rejoiced. Um, you know, there's a verse that says, you know, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore after the Red Sea when the Egyptians were drowned. And, and, the, le- and the legend, the Midrash says that, you know, that, that Israel was, was told, you know, you, you shouldn't rejoice over my, my people who died. All human mm-hmm. beings are my people. And, and, you know, where did they get this idea? You know, well, that actually comes from the book of Jonah where God speaks about, you know, um, at the end, there's the issue of, you know, Nineveh. Um, I'm going to read that passage because because this is this is like the guilty part of me saying I should care about the Egyptians. Um, I want to care about the Egyptians. It says then Yehovah said you cared about the plant which you did not work. This is Jonah four ten. You cared about the plant which you did not work for and which you did not grow, which appeared overnight and perished overnight. Verse eleven. And should not I care about Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand pe- persons who do not yet know their right hand from their left hand and many beasts as well. And so you know. The story there is that Jonah was upset that Nineveh didn't get wiped out because he had prophesied that it should be. <laughs> and God saying, yeah. look, I, I care about Nineveh. I love every single human being. And, and so in that respect, you know, when the Israelites saw the Egyptians dead on the sea, that, you know, there, there's definitely truth in it that they, they, you know, part of, you know, being faithful to Jehovah, the creator of the universe, is to remember those are human beings who are dead. Those are his creations. And we're mm. all created in the image of Jehovah. Um and, and so in that respect, we, you know, like I say, I'm conflicted here. I, like on the one hand, well, like, I don't, like, while I don't you're really, conflicted, yeah. let me tell you what happened. Let me, let me tell you what happened yesterday. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here, folks. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I, I, I made a mistake last week and said it was the most populous country. It's the most populous city uh, in, in, in the world in a called? place called Shanghai, China. Shanghai. And uh, yesterday on the day, which is, uh, which is a Christmas day here, which is like any other day. In China, as far as people being on the subway and all that stuff, I just, after I did my recording with Nehemiah, I decided I wanted to go over to a, a specific spot in Shanghai, I'll do a little check in, check in I just uh, just about the Christmas time issue and see what other trouble I can get in. So anyway, I, I decided to travel, and this is connected to kind of what you said, so so work with me here. I yeah. decided to take the subway on uh, Christmas Day down into uh, Shanghai, where all the people are it's very very busy, um, and I kind of had this in my heart. I needed to do two things. I had a technological problem. I had the problem with my, my, my computer that keeps cutting off, and, and Nehemi has already threatened that if it keeps happening, he's done with me. So I had to take my computer down to the it's Mac store. It's not a threat. Store. It's just an announcement. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's just how it's it is. An announcement. It's just the way it is. So I went down to this place, and sure enough, there's people. Oh, they got red and white on, and they got Christmas hats on, and they're singing Merry Christmas, and it's uh, Jingle Bell. Jingle Bell. They don't say L. It's a, uh, it's it's a, uh, it's a uh, you know jingle bell, jingle bell, and so anyway they're doing their thing, but now to this whole issue of the nations. So one of the struggles uh, for me is I have to just be honest is that I, I, I'm more comfortable um, when I'm in a place like Israel just because I love the land, I love the language, I love the people, and and the language of the Bible when I hear it spoken and when I hear um, you know and able to interact with it, it really just lights me up and inspires me. So I'm in a place right now where I don't ever hear that. All I hear is 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 Putunhua, Chinese and every other dialect that's connected with uh, with with Chinese. And so I'm I'm learning that language and I'm communicating with the people and trying to read the the characters. There's what two thousand or some that are actually used and ten thousand that are written. I don't know what it is. Some four thousand to be able to read a newspaper. Yeah. 4,000. So anyway, as I'm doing this thing, I mean, let me get to this point. So I'm doing this thing. I go up on an elevator. It's me and about 10,000 Chinese people that go to the top of this huge place called the uh, Pearl Tower. I'm up there. I'm looking. I'm taking pictures. Ah, ah, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm here by myself, by the way. Uh, Andrea's back in the United States. Uh, my son Andrew's actually here. He's, he's, it's another story. I'll get to that. But anyway, long story short, I'm by myself. I'm coming down the elevator, Nehemiah, and all of a sudden I hear Shalom Chavel. 
This guy's talking to me. What? It's Leon. No way. And listen, true story. Listen, true story. He was talking to I you? Look, no, no. Look behind me and a guy's talking on a phone. He's speaking Hebrew. Wow. As we're coming down the elevator, I turn over him. I say, Shalom Chaver. Mashlom Ka. He gets off the phone. He says, who are you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's got this thick Israeli accent. Who are you? Says, a, I have many friends who live in Jerusalem. Bemet? Lama. And he, so he starts talking to me, and we're talking for just like about a minute or so wow. in Hebrew, and it shocked him to the point that he looked at me and he just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, why am I telling this story? You know, this is this thing. So here's this guy. He's amongst the nations. Here I am. I'm amongst the nations. And he was so shocked that I was – he couldn't stop and say, what, what is this guy? You know, what is this well, – this guy is obviously not Israeli. He's like, clearly I'm not Israeli. He's like, why does he know this language? And I mean it was like an, op, an, an invitation to kind of have a conversation, a further conversation. Yeah. Now let's talk, I'm thinking. Let's discuss it. Here I am from the nations and I'm speaking your language and we're uh, in this place where we're foreigners – and it so shocked him, he just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if he thinks to himself, no, wait a minute, what does he have to do with me? In other words, what, what do I have to do with him? And I find this a lot if I'm speaking a language, and it happens in Chinese too, if I speak their language, like, wait a minute, you don't look like us. You don't think, like, what's going on? And, I, and again, back to your issue, mm -hmm. is, is it, isn't it not sometimes a struggle to mm -hmm. look at the bigness of of God and, and how and how big He is right. and who He's awakening and what He's doing. So again, just back to this issue of whether it's mm -hmm. Egypt or we're talking about Assyria or whatever. Right. And you brought it up last week. I thought was beautiful is that the possibility that those are references to the nation. So for me, I I'm I'm always I'm always a little put off when I don't sense this sort of connection with the nations. I want the nations to be well, awakened yeah, because that's where I'm, that, that's where I come from. I'm right. not I'm not one who can say you know I'm I'm from the I'm I'm King David's relative. You know I I don't get to say that like you. Know. Well and and, and, on the, and on the flip side, what, what you're pointing yeah. out, I think, without pointing it out, um, and I'm I can't speak, speak about the Chinese. I can't speak about other people. But there's definitely um, a certain amount of Judeocentrism, which is you know. You know, Jews. Jews kind of like were this persecuted people, not kind of. Jews were this persecuted people for two thousand years and became sort of insular. And there's definitely something in our culture about. Wait a minute, there's somebody from the outside. We don't need to deal with that. And, and look, I've struggled that with, it, with that in my own life, and have come to a place where I am now after after many many years of being on a journey that that Yehovah has taken me on. But but the 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 natural instinct is no no get out of here. This this isn't for you. This is our treasure. We're not sharing hey, this you with you what? Gentiles. Now, me, let me tell you something else that happened, and we're gonna we're gonna venture in a little bit because we. Have some time you don't want to talk about these other these other verses but let me well, just no, venture into something about else. verses but... no 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 <laughs> let me just go one thing that. i want to bring up let me tell you what i really sensed from this guy yeah i sensed from this guy a little bit of fear mm. like we were going down this elevator and this shocked him so much because those who don't know if you've never seen a picture of me i, I don't actually look like Nehemiah. I, I actually have the real brown skin and, and a bald-headed brown head skin guy amongst a bunch of chinese so i don't see me very much at all this guy happened to be of some some European uh, uh, um, uh, descent or, or whatever, and so he was looking at me. So there's the black white issue, then there's the language issue, and it was in, in around the world right now. Isn't it fair to say that there are many Jewish people around the world that have a certain level heightened sensitivity to to what's going on in terms of anti-Semitism, oh, the attacks absolutely. that are taking place? So when you know, I, I yeah, communicated, I, I actually met these. The, oh, go ahead. When, sorry, when go I communicated ahead. with this guy, it, the first thing I sensed was fear. He was like. Mm -hmm. what, why are you speaking to me in my – you don't look anything like me. What, why are you speaking to me in my language? And then he calmed down about floor 16 until we got to the bottom. But then he thought for himself and he thought, let me get out of here. <laughs> this is too Wait, weird. Wait, you were following him? You are stalking him? <laughs> I followed him. I wanted to talk. Shalom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there, you know, there's, there's definitely some truth to what you're saying. I mean, I, I, yeah. Like I think of it – I was in Nepal and I met these two Israeli girls. And, and they actually said to me, they said, do you tell people you're Israeli? I'm like, yeah. What's, why wouldn't I do that? And yeah. and I think kind of their generation has been trained like you don't tell people you're Israeli, you know you you you, you know you, you pretend you're from you know Monaco or someplace like that, um, you know or Malta, um, because there's a lot of people out there who want to hurt us. And you know in my generation that definitely was not not the mentality. You know I I, I remember I was in Changsha in China and I met this these two Syrians from from Damascus and you know. Um, I told them I was Israeli, and all of a sudden they got really cold on me and really, um, you know, unfriendly. But you know that's okay. Um, 
I'm I'm okay with that, you know, because yeah. uh, I you know I'm I'm proud of being Israeli. Amen. Well, anyways, I, th- I just think this you, you kind of you kind of led led me into this. This just happened, you know, 24 hours ago. Yeah. And I, I've I've addressed this a lot, and 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 still, and I can understand. I guess my thought was that I could understand a little bit of the sensitivity from a little bit of of, of just an issue in being in a foreign country and the mm-hmm. way that there's so many there's so many things that are going on internationally right around with terrorism and right. and, and and attacks and uh, you know this guy oh, and, clearly was. And, and I'll tell you, I was in in a place in China, and there was a Belgian guy there, and the minute he heard I was Israeli, he got nasty. You know, mm-hmm. he got really nasty and, and, and showed his ignorance about international affairs. Um, there are people who do hate, especially Europeans, not only, mm-hmm. but especially Europeans and obviously Muslims, um, who, who hate Jews and hate Israel. At the same time, of course, you know, I, I just, you know, people don't realize this. There are actually Muslims in the Israeli army who serve and fight for their country. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, everybody's different. Um, but I understand why some people are afraid. Okay. Well, there we go. Yeah. Well, um, can I can I can I keep reading? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So um, here it says. Uh, th- so he's talking about them. He says they have st- repeatedly stumbled. Are you are you done with your confession? Can we move on? Yeah, I'm just we can checking. move on. Let's do it. <laughs> I, I, I want to get to verse eighteen. Saying, I got something to say there. Or... Yeah, I appreciate you saying that actually because it really is a, a bit of a sensitive issue. In, but it <laughs> but it's uh, it's connected. They have repeatedly stumbled. Indeed, they have fallen one against another. They said, "Get up." And let us go back to our own people and our native land away from the sword of the oppressor. They cried there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a big noise. He has let the – and here comes the verse, Mm -hmm. 17. He has let the appointed time pass by. Mm. And and again, that happens to be the word. And I I don't know. Again, you're, you're is that the you're word gonna, of the week? We had that. that was no, the that's of the week, not like the word. Of the, ago, that happens it? to be the moed. moed. It happens to be appointed the, the appointed time uh, pass by. Now, mm-hmm. verse eighteen. Go at it, Nehemiah. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Here you. I love this. So it, it, it talks about Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Yeah, you know, he's just a bunch of noise. And then he says, "Chai anin um hamelech Yehovat zvaot shemo." As I live, saith the king Yehovah of hosts, is his name. So here, uh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> so Yehovah is proclaiming, as I live, which is a, 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 an oath, you know, as mm-hmm. Yehovah lives is what we say. But he himself doesn't say, as Yehovah lives, because he is Yehovah. <laughs> he says, mm-hmm. as I live, saith the king, uh, whose name is Yehovah of hosts. That's pretty cool. And then he speaks about Tavor. And all of a sudden, I, my ears start, you know, light up, and, and, I, and I'm starting to pay attention, because here's Tavor and Carmel. These are places I'm familiar with in Israel. Um, and, and as I was reading this, I was thinking, that's why I shared my confession, because I'm like, wait a minute, why do I like this verse? And the other verses where it talk about, you know, uh, Memphis and, and, you know, or Nof in Hebrew, like, what? <laughs> why do I not care about that? And that's what made me realize, oh, wait a minute, this isn't about me. It's not about Israel. It's that Judeo-centrism. Um, yeah, but here, he's, I, I, what I think is cool, it's, you know, as I live, saith the king, Yehovah hosts is his name. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you and, got a and king who makes further, a lot of noise. We got the real king. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and going further, when he says that, you know, I was going to ask a, a a a question. So in different languages, um, you you hear this this sound, you know, and he says he says hi hi ani, you know, yeah, life hi. or um live, you know, as and, I live, you know, and, right. and literally and so it's we, life. Yeah, life yeah. I as a literal yeah, translation. Life I, and so that's. Again, we get into the issue when he when he when he does these kinds of things. When he when he says this, you know, when he swears, I swear by myself. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like you can you can take it to the bank. Meaning that's something that when he gets mm-hmm. involved like that. And again, I like the fact that he that he uses the word declares the king because what yeah. did we just talk about? The king of the Egypt. King. Here's the real yeah. king. So I mean, now, again, I don't know if you remember this, but we, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe we talked about this verse in the book of prayer to our Father in the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. We were mm-hmm. looking for the place where Yeshua taught. The um, what's known as the Lord's Prayer or the Avinu, the Our Father Prayer, and um, there were, I believe, six places we went to. It was quite a number of years ago, but we went to six different locations that have been identified throughout history as the place where the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord's Prayer mm-hmm. was taught, uh, where the Sermon on the Mount took place. And one of the explanations or one of the traditions in the Christian world is that that took place on Mount Tavor. The, uh, or Mount Tabor, and the reason is because of this verse. You look around mm-hmm. the Galilee, and, and you, even in the Golan, as far away as the Golan Heights, and you look up and you see Mount Tavor looming among the mountains. It's just this really prominent, beautiful mountain. Um, you know, in, in Nepal, it wouldn't even be considered a, a hill, but in Israel, it's a mountain. Um, and uh, and so there were people who said, "Oh, Sermon on the Mount. We don't know the name of the mountain. It's got to be Tavor, it's the mountain, right?" 
based on this verse. <laughs> um, but, you know, in fact, that's probably not the best can. It's, yeah. it's unlikely that was the place. And actually, I have to say, um, and I love yeah. Israel. I think it's a beautiful place. We're actually yeah. going to be going there this spring. Uh, anyone that's interested, I think there's a couple more spots available if anyone's interested. Uh, we're going. This will be the third trip to Israel. But one of the things that really is kind of kind of cool is, you know, we, as you mentioned, we go to this. You know, this, we look to those different six spots. And I remember when I was actually in Israel, and we were talking about the mountain. And and I, I mean, I've been to different. I don't know how many different mountains I've been to, but. Uh, other than the fact that you were driving as if it was a mountain, it didn't look like a mountain at all. <laughs> I mean, it Wait, like are you insulting my like driving? Like <laughs> no, Mount Carvel. Now that felt a little bit like a mountain, but 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 but. but. <laughs> what Tavor didn't feel like a mountain? I, th- I think well, because Tavor I mean, is so Israel, big that you Israel, gradually get up to it. Yeah, when you whereas our bell is sudden, it, it's like hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I said, it felt like a mountain when you were driving on the way down. It definitely right. felt like a mountain, but on the way up, it was well, I th- like again. It's there. so big; it's almost like this gradual. It's kind of like this dome-shaped mountain. It's so exactly as you're like going, you don't really shape. feel like, oh, I'm going straight up. Whereas our bell, you're mm-hmm. literally at one point going straight up. Mm-hmm. Or straight so, down. Um, uh, so can yeah. can we keep reading here? Yeah, okay, make your make your baggage ready for exile. It says here. That's cool. Yeah, O oh, daughter dwelling in Egypt, for Memphis will become a desolation. It will even be burned down. And, and bereft of inhabitants. And then 4620, uh, Egypt is a pretty heifer, but a horse fly is coming from the north. It is coming. Now, now we talked about this last week about the 40 year mm-hmm. exile of Egypt. And, mm-hmm. you know, and look, I'm sure there's a lot of people with a lot of theories. Yes, that took place in, you know, 542 BC. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of theories like that. But the bottom line is we mm-hmm. don't really know. Has this even taken place yet? I mean, this sounds like it's got to be taking place in the time of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Nebuchadnezzar. Mm-hmm. And it's very possible he took part of the population exile, and we just don't have all of those details. I mean, that's what the Babylonians did when they conquered a place. They would they, they take would the take people. people exile, especially they would take the elite, and they'd mm-hmm. install their own elite, mm-hmm. so the, the ruling class. They would take, and then they'd install their own ruling class. And you know, mm-hmm. the lower rungs of society often just do whatever the rulers say anyway. Um, wherever those rulers are. So, yeah, that, that may have been something. I mean, it sounds like that had to be something in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe it's something that's going to happen in the future. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, it says here, also her mercenaries in her midst are like fattened calves. Mm-hmm. For even they too have turned back and have fled away together. They did not stand their ground for the day of their calamity has come upon them. The time of their punishment. And and again, the, the idea... I guess as I'm as I'm I'm reading through this, it's it's like uh, it gets to be these images. This is what's going to happen. This is what it's going to be like. This is the picture. And I think one of the things that I I do appreciate about um, these sorts of passages is it makes me again try to get a, be, be reminded of context. Here's an example. They're like a fattened calf. Now I could go and do a whole thing that these are they're fattened calves, and then it breaks down at some point you know here's the here's the image let's take that image all the way until the end and many examples of that many examples from my tradition where we'll take one image and then try to take that image to the end and then it will break down and even once once it breaks down you keep pushing it and you know and then someone comes along and says well that can't really be that because of this and and then all of a sudden you get kind of with your back against the wall so and you're not going to make me say what that is, right? Jeremiah 46, Actually, 22. I don't know what you're it's talking about. <laughs> good. That's good. Let's move on. It's okay. sound moves along like a serpent. They move on like an army and come to her as woodcutters with axes. Boy. Now, this I, part's you know, really, I, really mysterious. Can we read one more first yes. to, to finish the word yes, woodcutter okay. image? Yeah, yeah, they have cut down her forest, declares Yehovah. Surely it would no more be found, even though they are now more numerous than locusts and are without number. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what do you got to say about that? About the cut? Well, cutters? no, you're saying you're saying it's, it sounds. This sounds mysterious. You say it's mysterious because there's no forests in Egypt, and there never were. <laughs> so what is it talking about? They have cut down her forest. Now the locusts. Mm. They're more numerous than locusts. That may have been one of the reasons that you know the tradition that chose this passage said, oh, okay, well this will correspond to you know the Torah locusts. portion because we've got mm-hmm. the plague of locusts. Maybe that's why. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm assuming that's why. Um, you know, because there's a lot of prophecies about Egypt. Why this one? Um, so first mm. of all, there was the smiting in, in verse 13, which is the word for plague. And now we have locusts. This is a no-brainer. This has to be the section. But what are these forests they're cutting down? There are no forests in Egypt. <laughs> Egypt is, is mm-hmm. a, you know, Egypt is historically, I'm not talking about Egypt today, but historically, Egypt was the most narrow, longest country in the world. 
because mm-hmm. basically you have a, a few miles on either side of the of the Nile River, which goes for thousands of miles. But if you go 10 miles or 15 miles away from the Nile, you're in the middle of the desert and there's nothing there. So you could mm-hmm. travel, you know, a thousand miles and still be in Egypt, but you could also travel 10 miles and be in the middle of nowhere and, and it's completely desolate, uh, you know, the historically. Mm-hmm. So it was considered like one of the, you know, the longest country and, and narrowest country in the world. Um, and it was pretty much this continuous population, meaning that if you went along the Nile, every inch of the Nile, the shore there pretty much was um, was occupied by someone. It was, you know, uh, is actually different than, for example, the, in, the you know, India and the Indus Valley and and the and the Euphrates Valley, where there were cities that grew up very very early, Egypt was more or less this continuous population, all the way from mm-hmm. you know from what's today Sudan you know to to the to the Delta. Um, they had mm-hmm. cities, but also there was this just like people living everywhere. So, but where are these forests? There are no forests in Egypt. Hmm. I so no I have a theory. I have a new. I have a new theory. I have a new teaching, and it's it's. Yes. I'm the only one who knows this. So you've got to buy my book. Okay. It's my secret. No, I'm, I'm going to mm-hmm. share it. Mm-hmm. So what are the forests? I don't know, but it's possible that the forests are um, that they're the, um, you know, what do you call that? The, uh, the the temples. They had these temples in Egypt, mm-hmm. um, and there were these forests of of uh, of stone pillars holding up the roof. Holding up the you know hmm. the, the top of the of the temple, and they didn't actually have um, you know sometimes they would bring in uh, especially for the rafters they'd bring in cedar from Lebanon, but for the pillars to hold it up that they used stone because stone was abundant trees were you know very rare in Egypt, um, so maybe cutting down the forest is destroying the temples. It's possible. Okay, I, 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 I mean we'll, we'll we'll throw that in there with the possibilities of yeah. uh, of theories. Because no, otherwise, ask otherwise what's it talking about? And, and of course, mm-hmm. this opens up the possibility that Egypt here does not mean Egypt. It's an allegory for, you know, it's a symbol of mm-hmm. this, of Russia. And, and you know, this is, now we, we finally have the revelation that this is going to refer to Russia in the 21st century. And there are many forests mm-hmm. in Russia. And, you know, I don't know, mm-hmm. could be. So, so it's it's interesting. This is a one of the one of those issues too, where where we have these people that are listening. And I, I want to say again, Nehemia, that um, I'm really I've really been um excited about the depth uh, that people will go into when they are studying scripture. And and those that are listening that have, have their Bibles open, one or two translations, and 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 making the comments and us interacting with those comments. And there's nothing wrong with reading ahead. If somebody's reading ahead and they find you know something really really powerful. Let's just say that a passage like this that we're about to get to, you know, make a comment on our on our pages, and we'll we'll see if we can we'll see if we can um, be able to, to bring that. That's the kind of thing that yeah. would be awesome. But I want to ask a question in forty six twenty four, and I'm asking this question yeah. sincerely. When you hear the words "the daughter of Egypt has been put to shame," what image do you have? When you hear "the daughter of Egypt," what does that mean to you? Well, so so the image there, and we'll often hear about the daughter of Zion, you know, Bat Sion, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and the image there is the young women of that country. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what it. That's how you see it. So 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 saying the daughter of Egypt has been put to shame, given over to I mean, the power. Do, of the do you want me to be explicit on a, on a family program? What it means? <laughs> no, I'm. Ch- <laughs> no, that's no, what that's what it means. A, yes, we, we you know I'm daughter. not going to say what it means, yeah. but it's clear what it means. Right. It's 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 talking about when enemies invade. They you know mm-hmm. they do what armies do, and they take and the daughters the and they put them to yep. shame. You know it's it's mm-hmm. you know that that's what happens. Yep. That's what happens, and you know, and 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 actually, right now, um, <clears throat> um, in in parts of Africa, yeah, um, certainly we've seen it in other in other places in in Syria and uh, Iraq, uh, all over. That this is this is actually something that's taking place right now. Yeah, and um, it's tragic. It really is a horrible it's, thing. It's it's, 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 it's a tor- yeah. It really is, and and you can you can really pass over something like this and not know yeah. w- what it's speaking of, but you can turn on the news right now and you can hear about whether it's uh, the terrorists that are going in. You know, bring back our daughters. Right. What took it with Boko Haram, and 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 it's just it it really is. It's a mm-hmm. devastating, uh, it's a devastating thing, and and the right. testimonies of what's happening um, with different religious groups all over the world right now is this verse uh, definitely uh, comes to comes to mind right. with what's happening. Well, and, and maybe the so, most famous example in modern times is you know when when the Soviet army you know conquered um, Berlin. That there was, mm-hmm. and I'll just come out and say it. You know, if you want to mute this and send the kids out of the room, go ahead. Um, but when the when the Soviet army in 1945 captured Berlin, there was mass rape 
um, on a mm-hmm. industrial scale, um, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of women, and that's what this is talking about. And and I do mm-hmm. find it interesting. Um, from my Judeo-centric perspective, that in the entire history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, there's never been a documented instance where uh, an Israeli soldier um, actually committed that crime, and and mm-hmm. and Israel is actually very fastidious, very very careful about um, investigating uh, so-called you know or even actual war crimes. For example, if um, if if uh, if a soldier steals something from a house, even in the middle of a battle, if he picks it up, puts it in his pocket, and that's reported then he'll get in a lot of trouble. And that's happened. That has happened. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. what it's talking about in this verse has never been perpetrated in the history of the state of Israel by an Israeli mm-hmm. soldier, which, now, which, I, which I is actually unprecedented in history. I, I will say this. It, it, you know, you, you, you're, you're kind of tiptoeing around the issue, and I understood, I understood your, your reasoning for that. But I guess when we're reading scripture and you see something, the daughter of Egypt has been put to shame, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's easy not to know what that is. It's, I mean, it's easy right. just, oh, that must be some, you know, some language issue. Um, actually, here in China, they just uh, were, were, were looking at this this terrible thing that took place with the Japanese um, yeah. here over over here, and I mean they 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 are finally acknowledging it. And one of the things that's really interesting is the Japanese. Uh, uh, some of the parts of the population will acknowledge uh, what actually happened, and others won't. But over in China now, they're beginning. They built a museum and and, and um, memorials, et cetera, with you know tens of thousands of people. Uh, where this happened, tens of thousands of women where this happened. And so it's one of those things that, again, where scripture from of old can be brought to the present time and you can actually see it happening. So that's what this verse is about. Yeah. So verse six, uh, 46, 25. And let, and let me stop again. One of the things that is, that's really um, interesting, and I know this has been something that you've done for for as long as I've known you. Um, and sometimes you do it and I get frustrated because you say, oh, it's obvious. You know, this is obvious what this is. And clearly this is what this is. You know, and like – no, that's not clear. It's not always clear because because people don't always get context. And, and that's mm-hmm. one of the things about your ministry is being able to bring um, language history and context to the most important book. Certainly for those that are listening and many people around the world, the Bible uh, being the most important book, the Hebrew scriptures, where people don't have access to that information. That's one of the powers. That's that, that's really a powerful thing about what you do. So, I mean, I'm 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 handing you an opportunity. Oh, to, so, is this the ministry minute? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you don't have to actually say it every time. You just do it. It's no, just I, there. I, I said <laughs> so. Now for the ministry minute with Nehemia Gordon. Um, so yeah, so so my ministry is called the Makor Hebrew Foundation. M A K O R. Makor is the source of the water. That's from the verse in Jeremiah that the Yehovah is the source of the living water. And um, my website's nehemiaswall.com, nehemiaswall.com. And, um, uh, you know, yeah, so so one of the things I, I, um, I'm i doing in the upcoming weeks is or the upcoming months is, is going to be working on the Aviv search. Um, you know, the Aviv search is when we go to Israel and we scour the land looking for the first ripening barley, first fields of Aviv barley, and the first new moon after the Aviv barley, that's when the, the year begins. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that as, as time goes by. Um, and it's really interesting because there's or, these organizations in Israel, and a specific organization, the Israeli New Moon Society, which is a, a rabbinical organization, and they actually observe new moons every month. Every month, but they but they don't they don't use those new moons for observing the feast. They say this is practice and preparation for when the Messiah comes. And, and my approach as a Karaite Jew is to say, uh, I don't, I don't. When the Messiah comes, I want it to be able to, I want to be able to tell him, look, I was doing the best that I could while I was waiting for you. Um, so I'm doing this for for me when I do this. This isn't practice. This is real life, as, as real as life mm-hmm. gets. Um, uh, one of the other things going on in my ministry is, you know, I'll be traveling around speaking in the next few months, and and I want to. Um, invite people to invite me. People write to me all the time and say, how can we come and hear you? You know, or how can we get you to come to our town to speak and, and, you know, contact me, you know, write to me through nehemiaswall.com and we'll set something up and I'll do, you know, venues big and small. Um, uh, I really just want to awesome. share, share the word of God. And one last thing. Um, so, or two last things. Uh, so iTunes come to iTunes and subscribe to Nehemiah's wall, the podcast, Nehemiah's wall, and uh, give us ratings and reviews. It helps us get the information in front of people. And, and I'm really excited because, you know, uh, we're pre-recording this, obviously, and I just had this, um, the, and I shared about this before, I think, this this um, this teaching on Hanukkah that I put out for as a kind mm-hmm. of a thank you for my support team. And um, we had a whole bunch of people call up and say they wanted to join the support team. And, you know, they contacted uh, Dev, who runs the ministry. And, um, and, sh- and she'll talk to the people and say, so, you know, what's your background? Where are you coming from? You know, what are you now? 
Um, and sometimes people don't want to answer, and that's fine. But but the people who do answer is really interesting. And, and over the last couple of weeks, the people who have contacted us, almost all of them are Christians, which which I found I find really exciting, because in the past we've had you know lots of Jews and lots of Messianics, but these are people who are Christians who are who are discovering the Hebrew roots of their faith, who want to learn more mm-hmm. about it. And so so I'm really encouraged by that that this message is really going forward and spreading throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, one of the things that's happening uh, for, for me, again, re- reading this passage and talking about the nations, I actually happen to be amongst the nations right now, mm-hmm. um, literally. And uh, one of the things that is really, really interesting about being here, BFA International, we, we, we launched our site in China two years ago, and we launched the website, um, and we added the word international because we, we didn't want to just have it be there because it's a cool thing, but we actually wanted to, to make uh, an impact amongst the nations. And we're actually seeing right now people from different parts of the world that are um, clicking into BFAinternational.com uh, and, they're, and they're really interacting with us. In fact, at the end of this last calendar year, those that are listening today will be able to see a report that we're doing um, for the end of the year and we'll make that available on the website in an electronic version. It's called It's Happening. And what's happening, inspiring people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. And we're seeing this. And you can actually, one of the things that's really interesting is you can track where um, traffic is coming from in different nations. And, and that's probably the thing that, that, that probably is, it gets me most, the most jazzed is to see, uh, you know, 15 people from uh, a small country in Africa or 25 people in some aspect of place in the Philippines or 50 people in parts of Europe or 100 people or 2,000 people. And that's, again, where we're, we've really been working hard to get a message uh, around the world to the nations. And so for me right now, I'm, I'm over here in... And in, in the most populous city, 26 million people, and I'm around them all the time. The majority of them happen to be of Chinese descent, but I run into people from different parts of the world that are here. And, and it really is interesting, the interaction, whether it's speaking language or sharing a little bit of God's time, a little bit of his Torah, a little bit of his name, uh, it really is happening. And so I want to invite people to um, – to continue to pray for that mission and to actually um, build their faith now. You can go to the website and you can interact with us. Nehemiah was talking about uh, the, uh, the Aviv search, and one of the things that was such a blessing is he let us bring a camera on to see how he does what he does. So for those that want to support what he's doing, you can actually see what it is, and it's a powerful, powerful example of bringing um, the, the significance of God, God's time to our present day. So you can go to bfainternational.com. You can become a free member and see everything. You can become a part of the premium content library. We can have a seven-day free trial. See it all for yourself and cancel if you don't like it. But many people are signing up and they're liking it. And it really is allowing us to reach more and more people around the world, inspiring people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. So that is my ministry minute. And we can move on because we've got a couple more verses where you're going to get to take this thing and run with it. Are you ready? Let's do it. 46.25. And Yehovah of hosts, it says here. Yehovah Tzavaot, uh, the God of Israel says, Behold, I'm going to punish Ammon of Thebes and Pharaoh of Egypt, along with her gods and her kings, even Pharaoh and those who trust in him. Really? Wow. So um, the, 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 the gods yeah. and the kings? I mean, is, is, I mean wow. <laughs> well, that's something we talked about, I think, in the original Torah pearls, that, that the mm. plagues of Egypt – you know, the last plague, plague was uh, slaughtering a sheep and they worshipped, the, you know, the, they had this divine lamb that they worshipped. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Ammon here is mentioned by name, who is one of the, the Egyptian gods. And um, God's going to, you know, carry out judgment against, is the phrase in the Torah, carry out judgment against the gods of Egypt. So they worship mm-hmm. these living things and these living things are going to be going to be killed by Yehovah. He's going to mm-hmm. he's going to show them their gods are powerless and not only living things some of their gods are are you know statues and idols and and those two will be destroyed. And you know and I'm I'm gonna, I'm going to go out on a limb here and and um you're not going to like this cuz I'm going to jump to Jeremiah 10. And I'm doing that because today in Seattle, Washington where I am at the moment at my sister's house, it is Christmas Day. And Jeremiah 10 is a famous verse that's quoted by many people who believe it's talking about Christmas and 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 about the Christmas tree. Can I talk about this? I know it's completely off oh, topic. Oh, you can. It's Christmas Day. This you said, certainly uh, can. It's is, Jeremiah. This is your whatever Christmas, you like. Your Methodist Christmas gift for me to talk about Jeremiah 10. So here, I'm reading from the JPS. It says, Hear the word, this is Jeremiah 10, 1. Hear the word which Jehovah has spoken to you, O house of Israel. Thus says Jehovah, thus said Jehovah, do not learn to go to the way of the nations and do not be dismayed by portents in the sky. Let the nations be dismayed by them. It's talking about astrology. For the laws of the nations are delusions. For it is the work of a craftsman's hands. 
he cut down a tree in the forest with an axe. And people say, there it is. It's the Christmas tree. He cut down the forest with the <laughs> axe. He adorns it with silver and gold, called tinsel in English. He fastens it with nails and hammers so that it does not totter. Um, they are like a scarecrow in a cucumber patch. They cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Well, that's mm-hmm. not really Christmas tree. Who carries the tr- Christmas tree? And why would you say the Christmas tree can't speak? That's a strange thing mm-hmm. to say. It goes on. It says, be not... Be not afraid of them, for they can do no harm, nor is it in them to do any good. Um, so the, I I think the context here is really clear that this is not talking about a Christmas tree, um, which maybe has another biblical problem, the whole issue of the Asherah tree. Um, mm-hmm. But what this is talking about is an idol, a statue, mm-hmm. and that's why it has mm-hmm. nails to hold it from stumbling, um, and it can't it has a mouth, but it can't speak. This is a theme throughout the Tanakh. It has a mouth, but it can't speak. It has legs, but it can't walk. Right? That's the, and so people would see these statues and they'd be like, oh, wow, that, even though we don't worship that God, that has power, that, that thing. And here Jeremiah is saying it has no power. Don't be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. And it says, oh, Jehovah, it's, there is none like you. You are great, and your name is great in power. Amen. That's Jeremiah 10, 6. Love that verse. Why, uh, who would not revere you, O king of the nations? And, it, and that's pretty cool because we hear about the king of Israel. We just read that in our verse. And here Jehovah is called Melech HaGoyim, the king of the nations. For that is your due, since among all the wise of the nations and among all their royalty, there is none like you, but they are both dull and foolish. Their doctrine is but delusion. It is a piece of wood. Now we're talking about the statue again. It's a piece of wood, right? So verse Mm -hmm. 9, I'm almost done. Silver beaten flat that is brought from Tarshish and gold from Ufaz, the work of a craftsman in the goldsmith's hands. Their clothing is blue and purple. Blue and purple? That's not a Christmas tree. That's actually the statues that were donned in in blue and purple, which Mm -hmm. was the royal garments. All of them are the work of skilled men, but Jehovah is truly God. He is a living God, not like the statues. The everlasting king at his wrath, the earthquakes, and nations cannot endure his rage. So I'm not saying that, you know, I'm in favor of Christmas trees. I'm Jewish. I've never had a Christmas tree in my life. The point is, though, let, let's understand what the verse actually means. It's talking about idols. Absolutely. The idols are fastened with nails to keep them from tottering over, right? Because they don't. Their feet are useless. <laughs> uh, it's not a Christmas tree. It's an idol that looks like a human but actually can't speak or walk and, and can't even stand by itself. It needs to be carried. Um, and, and the point of this prophecy is don't worship the idols. Don't be, don't believe in them. Don't even think they have any power. Um, Jehovah is the only one with power. He's not just the God of Israel. He's the king of all the nations. Amen. You know, it's interesting because of your background. You you probably don't don't realize the level of uh, worship that some people do put into those trees. Oh, and, 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 and I'm and not what, saying and, Christmas and, trees are okay. Uh, let me finish. I'm on my I'm on my, my, my box. No, yeah. let me. I'm on so my box. box. So yeah. the, the, if you you go to some 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 groups of people, some some organizations, some yeah. families, some. I mean, where that tree literally. I mean, it literally becomes as if it's an idol, and to the point that that um. There, there's a certain level, and, and I think some people that are listening will understand this, that there's a certain level of worship that takes place with the trees. And we don't, we don't have to go into the ancient issues of the, uh, the Asherah or anything like that. There are some people that even today, when you talk about the Christmas tree, I mean, you, you don't touch the tree. You don't. Really? I mean, it is. I've never it, heard oh, that in my you, life. Have, you have no idea how, how far it goes. Really? And I think some, some that are listening wow. would understand that one of the reasons that there is sometimes a parallel mm-hmm. isn't that what Jeremiah is talking about. I mean, it's it's a, it's a convenient it's a convenient parallel as far mm-hmm. as fastening and all of that. Yeah. But when some people put that tree up, it's as if they're putting up their false god. It's as if they're putting up their place of worship. It becomes the center of attention from the time that it's up until the time that it's mm-hmm. down. How it's treated, wow. who can touch it, what you put on it, how it's how it's given uh, 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 prominence in its place. So I do think that it, you know, mm-hmm. if you go a little further, and I appreciate the fact that you brought that up, yeah. if you go a little further in terms of things that were done with trees, we certainly don't have to go to Jeremiah 10 for that. We can go right. to the Sidonians and many others that are in Scripture that would use it, you know, what, what, what they did with trees. But I think, that, I think the thing that becomes interesting for us today, at least in our society, I want to give credit to those people who in their, in their hearts and in their minds, they've come to a place to say, you know what, this became prominent. This became yeah. bigger than God. And, and that's really at this time of year. The thing that concerns me is I'm over here in this part of the world. Yeah. Like I said last week, there's no religious aspects uh, to Christmas. But you know what they talk about on the news? <laughs> I mean, what are they, about? they talk about the God of economy. They talk about Christmas being a is money the thing. They talk news? about it in the Chinese news. Wow. They, when, when they talk about Christmas, they talk about the first thing. 
money. The right, second that's thing, true. For the Chinese, it's, it's all it's about money. That's absolutely it's true. It's all about <laughs> money. Now, guess what? I, and I'm going to give you a secret yeah. and then we'll get off this. Yeah. For the people over in, in, in the United States, the, those that love to put up those trees and do that, and I'm not talking about those families that get together, but, the, but the, those organizations, it's also about money. I mean, you talk about the Christmas season and the shopping season and how it's expensive. I mean, it's about the God of money if I've ever seen it. So to me, I think that it's it's pretty clear that we have we have you know we have a real issue in terms of what becomes the focus yeah. anything that becomes the focus that is not him or that takes the place of him and man I have seen this in ways that just are shocking and it's spreading and I got to leave you with one other thing about this yeah. in China the older people in China yeah. They're like, what are you doing celebrating Christmas? Right. The New Year's <laughs> coming. You know, the Chinese New Year's coming. But right. the young people are saying, hey, we think there's something kind of cool to this. We get to shop. So on Christmas Eve, at the, when the sun sets, after work, <laughs> they hit the streets <laughs> and they're doing the, the Black Friday thing with the money. And then in their minds are like, well, that's what this is all about. And I'm actually concerned for them about that because it becomes – it can morph. And when it morphs, it becomes something that um, attempts to take the place – and I'm not talking about here. I'm talking more in the United States mm-hmm. – take the place of God and they sort of wash it over with a little singing and a little – you know, um, Jesus is the reason for the season when in fact it really is becoming about money. So, mm. so, yeah, let, I guess so, going so let, me, let me wrap up my part of it, which is Deuteronomy 16.21. Thou shalt not plant – and this is the King, the King James says, Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Mm. And what it actually says in Hebrew is you shall not plant an Asherah, any tree – next to the altar of Jehovah your God. And, and Asherah was the sacred tree. It was a tree that was worshipped. It was a tree that was holy. Um, and sometimes they didn't actually have a literal tree. Sometimes it was just a pole because trees aren't very abundant mm-hmm. in Israel. So they would take a, uh, the, the pole of a, a tree that had been, literally they'd been cut down and they would bring it to, you know, next to the altar. And so definitely this idea of venerating trees, that, that is completely oh, forbidden goodness. by the Torah. Here's where I want to com- agree with you but, but make a point. So uh, here I'm, I wrote down your exact words. You said the Christmas tree – has quote literally become as if it's an idol and where i want to agree with you is that that may be true but first we have to understand what an idol is and then we can say that Mm -hmm. it has become as if it's an idol Mm -hmm. so first we need to understand the literal meaning of of jeremiah 10 and then we can say okay this is literally talking about a statue an idol that's paraded around in the streets that's you know wrapped in in gold and silver that that's you know given a stand so it can stand up and then say that that's really like the Christmas tree. I have no problem with somebody who wants to say that. Look, where I have a problem not, with I've somebody who says, Nehemiah, Jeremiah I've foretold the future that there would be Christmas look, trees. Give me a break. No, no, no. He doesn't have to do that. I've got an axe yeah. and I'm smashing and cutting down trees. You're Just Gideon. call me the smasher and the cutter down guy. You're, that's what I do. You're Gideon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now can we get to the big verse Let's here? I mean, come on. Yeah. We? Okay. So, um, uh, I, I shall give them over to the power of those who are seeking their lives, even into the land of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of his officers. Boy, did that not happen. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, however, it will be inhabited as in the days of old, declares Yehovah. Now, we're, then we get to this but, uh, or it says, this, at least this, in English, is, this is the tie-in. This is how it's relevant for me. <laughs> yes, here, 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 yeah, here we go. And now I've always said, well, I woke up. <laughs> 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 okay, now here we go. Verse 27. Yeah. We want to give you this. But as for you, Nehemiah, yeah. tell us how this affects you here. It says, And you, Al Tira of Diakov, and you do not fear my servant Jacob, Val Techat Israel, and do not uh, be afraid, Israel. Um, for Kihini Hinini Moshiacha Merachok, for I am your savior. We had that word Moshia from afar, uh, uh, and your seed from the land of, of their um, captivity. And Jacob will return, and sh- it shall be of a shakat v'sha'anan ve'en macharid. I love that. And he will be mm-hmm. uh, literally quiet and um, and um, tranquil, and none shall make him afraid. Um, and actually, in the NASB, it has uh, no one making him tremble. That's that's a really good translation. Uh, in the JPS, it's none to trouble him, which isn't actually what it mm-hmm. says. In the King James, that's our word of the week, by the way. King James says, none shall make him afraid. So I want to talk about that word afraid, which actually does mean to tremble. Um, the word mm-hmm. is machrid. Mem chet resh yud dalid. Every word in Hebrew is a three-letter root. Um, the three-letter root of this word is very clear. It's chet resh dalid, which means to shake, literally to shake in fear. Um, mm-hmm. Although it could also be shake, shaking in, in awe. For example, there's a group of people in Israel today which we call in English ultra-Orthodox Jews. In Hebrew, they're called Haredim, which means the shakers. Mm-hmm. 
because they they claim that they tremble and shake in the presence of God. Um, it's arguably whether they really do that, but um, that's the word chared, which means to tremble. And, and, and I have a story I want to relate about my little nephew Ehud, who at the time was five years old this past summer uh, in Israel during the time of the um, the, the war in Gaza. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'm going to qualify that and say that the summer 2014 war, because I'm sure people listening to this sadly in the future will say the war in Gaza, which one? There have been 10 since you've spoken. Uh, I'm sad to say that. that's probably the reality. Um, but I, I spoke with him on the phone and he lives out very far from Gaza. He lives uh, in the desert out about 15 minutes outside of Jerusalem. You've been to his house actually. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, my, my oldest sister's house. And um, little Ehud was telling me about how when the air raid sirens uh, sounded for the first time, uh, he was terrified. And he says, I, I jumped on the ground and he says, you know, I was shaking, I was trembling. And he used this word, um, you know, and, and in modern Hebrew, that's come to have the meaning also of anxiety, you know. And, and so this poor little five-year-old, he's just, you know, well, playing with the ball. Tell us how he said it, Nehemiah. Yeah. Yeah. He was saying, you know, Hayali uh, charada and radati. You know, the, used a couple of phrases there, which, which mean to shake. And so there's this image when you're really afraid, you shake, you tremble. Um, and it's saying Israel will have a time of peace. And in that time of peace, when that comes in the end, none will make you afraid. None will make you tremble. Oh, that will man. not happen. There'll be no more terror to make you afraid. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. And he goes man. on, he says, uh, and you do not fear my servant Jacob, says Yehovah, for I am with you. And that's his theme throughout the Tanakh. I am with you. For I will, uh, uh, for I will, it's difficult to translate, but basically I will, I will care, uh, I will perform complete destruction amongst all the nations where I cast you out there. Um, but with you, I will not completely destroy. And it says, that's interesting. Uh, here in the King James, it says, but correct, but I will correct thee in measure. Um, which I have no idea what that means in English, but in Hebrew, what it says is, "I'm gonna, I'm going to." Um, uh, how do you translate this word? Um, I will. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I know the translation, but I don't want to use it. I, I will rebuke you uh, with with judgment. In other words, there's going to be some kind of punishment. There's going to be some kind of pain. Okay. And and the word mm -hmm. there, um, you know, it can imply. Uh, well, let me let me read you a verse. Um, let's see. So Leviticus twenty six eighteen, and if you will be, uh, let's see, sorry, let me read a different translation. Um, and after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Um, and the word punish there is the same word, yasar. Um, so it's this word that means punishing. Um, yeah, and uh, correction, it's sometimes translated, it's it's really being beaten with a stick. That's what I didn't want to say, but I'll say it. Okay, mm -hmm. he's going to beat mm -hmm. us with a stick for judgment, okay? Um, mm -hmm. So, so there, and then you will, and you will not go wholly unpunished. It says, v'nakelo anakecha, you will not be completely cleared, you will not be completely made clean. So first there's going to be this judgment, but eventually, you know, I, but I won't completely destroy you the way I'm going to completely destroy some of those nations that I cast you into that, that, that harmed you. You you'll get punished, but it won't be complete. And then there'll be peace. And at that peace, then at that pit time, there'll be tranquility, and none shall make you afraid. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I, I will tell you, even though we're at the end of our our deal here, Nehemiah, I'm I, you know, I'm I'm still three verses back. I'm really frustrated really? right now. Are you really? Can talk about those three verses I, back? No, no, I'm I'm, I'm upset. <laughs> no, no, I'm upset, and I'm, I'm at the end here, and I'm going to make a decision here. While for everyone that's listening right now, uh, normally we don't do this, but I'm going to do it because yeah. Nehemiah has thrown down the challenge. I, I, I cannot that? believe he he brought this Jeremiah 10 thing. I, I actually, I, no, you you know what you've done, Nehemiah. I actually you don't really know what I've upset. done. It's Christmas, no, I'm so I talked about right the now. Christmas I'm issue. Frustrated. No, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated. So, folks, here's what I'm going to do. Up until the date of this 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 weekend, yeah. which is January 24th, we're going to keep the Christmas special up until this weekend is over. Free, no registration. All you do is go through the time door, and you're going to go through the time door on the BFAinternational.com page, and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to register. You don't have to do anything just because of Nehemiah talking about the tree. Wait, do you talk I'm about this verse in, in, your, in your video? Is that what you – No, no. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep this up, in, uh, up on 24 until the 24th and let people watch it and make their own response because yeah. I, am, I am so – I. I, you know, I'm 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 really I'm I'm struggling with this whole Christmas thing, and I've been right. struggling for a long time with it. But I'm mostly struggling because of the the level of honest. How can I put this? Th this um, th it's it feels like 
worship. It's like worship that of people – uh, not just the tree. Everything talking? about it. You know, they, 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 the, 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 the flute, the zither, and the lyre, they, they ring it up and say, okay, everyone sing together, and now everyone is singing. And, doing, and, and I think the thing that just frustrates me, and reason why I, I just have to tell you, Nehemiah, mm-hmm. I'm over here in China. The, I, can, I can put it in a different category here yeah. because over here – it's not religious to them. Oh, there's there's no shame in China. It's about money. They'll tell you that. It's They're about not ashamed money. To say that. But in the United States, what struggle? What I struggle is, is that they make it the smells, and everyone talks about. Oh, I feel spiritual now. What are you talking about? I mean, it, look, I got we got to end the recording here. I'm going to keep it up until the 25th, until people have gotten through this. This January I'm upset, 25th. and after that, we'll put it or away. December 25th. I, it's December 25th today. You, you know, and next week we'll see if we can get 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 out. But you you, you really touched a nerve here, and so I've got to wrap up my end of. Uh, Prophet Pearls, I'm so glad that people listen. I'm especially glad for your confession, Nehemiah, but you touched a nerve okay, now. Now, so now, now, I, now I want to bring this for those, you know, a lot of people here, Keith Johnson, he's the Methodist pastor. So so can you confess, now, give a confession now? Can I, can I pry a confession out of you? So Methodist pastors, they celebrate Christmas. Is that right? I just saw, I don't know. Is that true generally? What do you mean? You, what, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm asking a question. Is it yes or no? It's the biggest time of year. Are you kidding me? So they do it's celebrate the Christmas. Time okay. Of year. So you as a Methodist pastor, do you celebrate Christmas? Absolutely not. Okay. That's what I want to know. Okay. No, no. And, and, and let me tell so you something. So you're telling you know, me like, on Christmas Eve you don't have a Christmas ham next to your tree and open the open the presents? What, let me tell you what something. What kind of Methodist I, I got, pastor okay. are you? No, no. So I'm here. No, no. There's no, there's none of that at all. And this guy writes this thing. And now, can I can I just bring? We got a month, one more minute. Yeah. This guy goes we to do. the Biblical Foundations Facebook page, yeah. and he writes these words. Yeah. Can, can I just sure. can I just tell you what he read? It's part of your ministry minute. He now. says, Go ahead. "It always amazes me that Keith, a biblical neophyte, has thousands of dollars thrown at him because he isn't a threat to Christianity like first fruits of Zion. While Keith burdens into while Keith blunders into answers." FFOZ researches the Bible and rabbinic commentary to prove that Jesus is Lord of the Jews and Gentiles and that Messianic Judaism, what Jesus will preach when he returns. Because Keith worships on Sunday and doesn't keep Torah, he is of no threat. Thus, he gets to say, show me the money, and they give it to him. <laughs> well, this is written on the BFA. Wait, look, so is it I'm true? Do you, do you worship on Sunday and, and – you, what was the other you thing? touched a nerve. No, I don't worship on Sunday. No, I believe the Torah is good for us today. I am not a person who gives one inkling of thought to spend my time finding out about rabbinic commentary. I mean, he's talking about what I do. And so here's these assumptions. And so I've you know, done this thing for a while. Mm. You've touched a nerve. It's this time of year. Now it's January that people are listening. I would just challenge people to find out for themselves based on what we teach, what we present, what you see, and quit making assumptions and, and just get it for yourself. What, I, what I've always liked about you, Nehemi, you can stand up and say, I'm a right Jew and I don't believe, da, 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 da. Well, as soon as I say I'm a Methodist pastor, which I am, officially until they kick me out there's all sorts of assumptions so what i love about our site is it gives a chance for people to see for themselves instead of a guy like this guy making assumptions just show me the money show me the money where is it (laughs) i can't find it (laughs) you're amazing to hang in there with me nehemia you gave me an extra minute so if you got anything you'd like to say to end this i certainly would like to tip my hand to you but i I think you really uh, touched some nerves yeah you know and i I opened up the episode with with my introduction (laughs) so i think you need to close in prayer (laughs) Oh boy, conviction. Yes, I will close there. But I do appreciate this. Um, Father, I want to thank you for an opportunity to learn what you love and to learn what you hate and to apply it into our lives. This is something that we do when we're confronted with the Word of God. And it's just an amazing opportunity for those that are listening. I pray that they would not take this as just a simple program that they're listening to, but an invitation to open the scriptures and to interact with them and to find the pearls that are there that you have made for us and given to us. And in the meantime, I pray for a heart of peace and uh and uh, help us to keep a perspective uh, for the world as is your perspective that we you would touch the nations and we'd be a light to the nations. And now for this this just for this chance to to be in this part of the world and Nehemiah where he is and for the technology to work, we want to thank you and pray that you'll continue to keep your hand upon us as we uh, continue to do this this important aspect of, of searching the scriptures to see exactly what they mean for us today. In your name we pray and we say together, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit nehemiaswall.com and bfainternational.com.